Goodwood Revival meeting, Whitson Trophy, Ford GT40, unbelievable. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun that you know, and um, well, Goodwood Revival is a is a meeting where you, uh, I guess it's uh, you have to bring some excitement to the fans, and uh, you know it's it's a great meeting. Um, you get to drive some old, really nice cars and get to meet all the people in the industry. I really enjoy it. But I guess when you've done as much as you've done, it's prob they're probably a bit slow and a bit heavy, aren't they? Well, <laughs> they're, they're it's, it's all relative, isn't they're, it? They're not as fast as an Indy car or F1 car, but you know, they're very challenging cars to drive because it's, you, you know it, it, they were built in the sixties and they're they're really quite fast to to uh, to be built in the sixties. They they're fast and uh, Goodwood is a challenging track, and uh, so it's it's quite an, a challenge from a driver perspective, I, I think. Um, we'll just stick on historics because. You love the old stuff, don't you? You do. You've done a lot of historic rallying. I, I have. I kind of slipped into the historic sort of pocket in motorsport when I, I stopped racing in 2005, um, and then um, a guy from Sweden sort of persuaded me to make a comeback. He built rally cross cars, and he was he was he wanted me to do the X Games, you know, uh, in the States. And uh, four years after my retirement, uh, you know, I said yes, let's go do it, and we happened to win it. And I happen to enjoy it as well. Uh, so from that point, I've, I sort of slipped into racing again in a more, uh, um, I don't know, uh, I do one or two races a year. And the historic pocket is, I, I never really knew it existed because when you're a professional in, in, in the modern stuff, you, you're so busy with that. You don't really look, you don't broaden your, you, you don't lift your eyesight, you know. And I happen to uh, hook up with a team here in England called Lansanti. And also I hooked up with the uh, historic uh, rally sport down in Wales, and he builds uh, Ford Escorts. So yeah, then I started driving some rallies and some historic race cars, and it's, uh, it's great fun. I suppose being Swedish, you must have grown up with a love of rallying, and you were... I, I did. You were probably going sideways in your, in your pushchair, weren't you? As a matter of fact, I lived just uh, next to a special stage in the Swedish rally. Uh, and when I was a kid, uh, I, me and my father used to take the car and drive across the lake in the wintertime when it was frozen. And then we'd walk up in the forest and we, we'd watch the rally cars come by. And I loved it. My, my hero was Björn Voldegord, who uh, at that time drove a Lancia Stratos. And it was amazing because you could hear these cars you know, five, six miles out, and, and it, you know, it built and built, and then they came by you, and the flames, and, you know, it was just a fantastic experience. There, there is no greater sound than a uh, Ferrari V6 engine Stratos. Yeah, no, no, yeah, as a matter of fact, all those cars back then, you know, today, uh, the, the sound experience is kind of gone from rallying, because, you know, they don't rev as high, they don't, they're not as loud, but it was, the, it was mesmerizing, I thought. Did you then make a, a conscious decision to not go into rallying, but to, to pursue the single-seater dream? I, I didn't. It, was, it, it all happened uh, the way it happened. It was no, um, uh, you know, I, I was interested in rallying as well, uh, but a neighbor of mine who helped me start my racing career, he was kind of more into racing, so he bought me a go-kart, and I worked as his uh, youth hostel in the summer, and, and instead of paying me, he bought me a go-kart, and... I started down that route because of it, and then I, you know, Formula Ford, and, and, and so it went, so. And you got all the way to Formula 3000. Uh, you yeah. were a, a, a race winner in that, and, and then the, the decision to move to America. What, what spurns you to do that? Well, I w you know, everybody dreams of Formula One, of course, but <coughs> and, and so did I, and, and I, had, uh, I had a test contract. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, I the timing of it was, uh, it wasn't the right deal. I, I did some tests in Formula One, uh, but it wasn't what I was looking for. It, it, um, I, I didn't feel I could make progress, so I, I resigned from that uh, position myself, and which was unusual in the day. Uh, but I felt I couldn't make any headway, um, you know, to, to get in and, and really make a statement in Formula One because you obviously need a good team and a good car. So. Uh, I took uh, my bag and went to the States instead and, and found an IndyCar ride. And, um, and, and th from there, it, uh, it, it snowballed uh, on and I managed to get, um, yeah, g g both uh, good payment and, and, and a lot of success. So. And the small matter of winning the greatest race in the world, the Indianapolis 500. Uh, fabulous memories, I suppose, of that. 
It, it was great, you know. I, I hooked up with AJ Foyt in my second year of IndyCar racing, and uh, he is a is the biggest uh, one of the biggest American icons uh, there is in racing, and so and we got on really well. We still to this day we have great connection, and um, he he taught me a lot about uh, you know the American racing. And uh, we won the Indy 500 together, and um, it, it was, uh, you know, it's something that always uh, stays with you. I mean, I, I guess, uh, unless you've experienced it, the atmosphere at that place, and, and uh, holding the Borg Warner Trophy up and kissing the bricks, and it must be out of this world. It is. Uh, you know, you walk into that place, and it's got like a golf course inside it, and it's a big place, and you, you see all these stands, you know, it's like half a million people there watching the race, and... You, fr from the perspective of being European, you can't really uh, understand how big uh, this track is. It's uh, it's quite, uh, you know, it's awesome when you see it, and it's kind of, uh, you know, a little um, you, terrifying <laughs> to start with. But, uh, yeah, you get used to it, you know? Yeah, and talking of terrifying, um, it, it all went horribly wrong for you, didn't it? It uh, Texas Motor Speedway at the end of 2003. We've got a clip, ladies and gentlemen, of... Uh, Kenny's now legendary accident um, coming up on the screen any second now. Um, do you remember this? Um, Can you I remember anything I, about I it don't at all? Really, I don't really remember it. You know, I've seen it numerous times, um, but nothing of that is um, is in my head anymore. Um, but um, there is absolutely nothing left of your I car. I was talking the top. Yeah, I know. I was talking to a friend of mine. He said he went to the Texas Motor Speedway to see a NASCAR. I said. I have got some bones left in turn three, so <laughs> you know. But yeah, it was. Um, That's uh, uh, yeah. It, it, it was. I think I've seen enough of that. That's. Um, it was big injuries, but uh, I think that um, the you know the the brain erases uh, memories like this. You know, it's. Uh, I still can't remember. I remember. I think I remember one pit stop from the race, and then I remember we had a parade before the race. Uh, with uh, Tony Canaan and uh, and Helio Castro Neves and and Dario and people, we went down the sta uh, the um, the uh, stands celebrating, uh, you know, saying hi to the fans. So bits and pieces, but nothing from the the majority of the race and nothing from the accident. I woke up five days later. That's the first memory I have after after that. So, I guess look, I, looking back, you don't have any regrets because you survived and others have not been as lucky. And now you're you're just having fun now, aren't you? And you're racing. You know, no matter how you look at it, uh, th that this was this was and is my life, and uh, you know there are risks with the uh, motorsport, especially that type of racing. Uh, but you know I wouldn't trade it for for the world. I mean I I made a career out of it. I was very successful the Indy 500, the IndyCar Championship. Uh, met lots of people, made a good living, and uh, you know I, I I couldn't be happier. It's uh, it's a great uh, great memories. We've got to finish on uh, AJ Foyt. We, we've touched on him, but can you please persuade him to come to the Festival of Speed at Goodwood? <laughs> he's, the, he's the last big guy, yeah. uh, physically and metaphorically, <laughs> that Lord March is trying to get to the yeah, festival, I, and he hasn't succeeded. I spoke with him uh, at Indy last year about it, and he, he, um, he obviously knows about the event, and he, but he's just like, oh, I'm not going to go. I'm too, too old. I don't really want to fly anymore. I, I'm, you know... Uh, so, but so I think he loves it, but he just doesn't want to transport himself there. But uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll work on him. Well, he would love it, wouldn't he? He would. He would it yeah. is yeah, amazing. He yeah, he would. We need to think of a sort of an anniversary or a, a real reason to get him there. Yeah, um, it's, it's good to see you. Um, pleasure. Keep up the good work, and you'll be back at Goodwood, I hope, won't you? Please. Uh, I, well, you know, I, I'm sure I will, but I have, nothing uh, is set at this point, but uh, I'm sure I will be there. I think it's a Adrian, great event. Adrian will have you back, won't he? <laughs> and le let's hope it's raining. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Brack.